Hey folks, Matt Eaton here, Scholar Gladiator. Now, we're used to seeing things like made in China or made in Taiwan or made in Germany written on products today. Completely normal to us. But where did this all start? So first of all, thanks for tuning into my channel. This is Scholar Gladiator. I'm Matt Easton. If you're not already subscribed, please consider doing so in the um, button down below. Now let's get on with the video. So yeah, made in Germany, made in England. Where did these come from? Where did it start? Now, these days, many people would associate made in Germany with a product, um, perhaps an engineering product of high quality, something reliable, something um, precision made. But it wasn't always the case. Now, people, for example, who know things about pottery uh, know that made in England on a ceramic product, um, a vase or a plate or something like this, basically means that it's 20th century. So if you're in an antique shop and you pick up a plate and it's got made in England on it, it basically means it's 20th century. It might not even be in antique actually, which is 100 years old, incidentally, if you didn't know. If it's um, less than that, then we would class it as vintage. So if it has made in England on it, this pretty much means um, that it, or indeed made in Germany, then it pretty much means that it's a 20th century product. And by and large, this pretty much came in as a result of American USA um, import regulations. To be a bit more specific, if we have England on something, then it probably means it dates to after 1890. But if it says made in England, then it probably means it dates to after 1921. And that's according to American or USA import regulations. It was the 25th president of the USA, William McKinley, who introduced the highly protectionist McKinley Tariff Act of 1890. This imposed tariffs on many imports, including pottery, amongst other things, in order to make it easier for American manufacturers to sell their products. However, this sort of labelling, at least in Britain, in Great Britain, actually goes back a little bit earlier and isn't only related to US import regulations and isn't only related to pottery or silver or the other things that we find these on. In fact, as you may have guessed from the wall behind me, one of the other objects that we find this on is in fact on swords, on antique or vintage swords. And here I have a sword, it's a Royal Artillery Officer's sword. And on the back here, on the spine, is Made in England written on the back. And equally we find other swords, uh, this is an Infantry Officer's example by Wilkinson, which have um, London Made written on the back. Now. Whilst to some degree these were related to the marks we find on things like pottery and silver and in fact all other products going to the USA and to various other countries who have uh, similar regulations as well. Um, in fact in Britain there, it was a little bit more complicated than that and it went back a little bit earlier. In fact in the specific case of swords this trend wasn't at all driven by trade with the USA because very few swords were exported to the USA and it was the British home market that dictated this move. So London made, specifically on swords, is to differentiate them from um, swords, other swords made elsewhere in the UK, for example Birmingham or Sheffield, which were two of the other places that many swords were being uh, made. And it was regarded at the time that London sword companies, such as Wilkinson and Pillin and Garden and companies like this, were they regarded themselves as a cut above uh, of better quality than the um, Birmingham or Sheffield sword makers. And to some degree, this is sort of true. There were certainly some uh, more mass production and lower quality makers in uh, Birmingham and Sheffield. But that being said, there were also some fantastic makers in Birmingham specifically. Um, so for example, Robert Molan Sons and also Charles Reeves. And both of these, um, in fact, became the biggest manufacturer of swords, bayonets, lances and cutlasses for the British military, for the War Department, that is both for the Army and for the Navy. Um, so in fact, there were some very, very good makers in Birmingham. But the fact is that these um, London makers, many of whom catered specifically to officers, so I think there's a social kind of snobbery element involved here as well. But there's also a nationalistic element to this as well. Having London made or made in England on your sword denotes that it wasn't a foreign import. And the fact is that up until about the 1880s, uh, pretty much the middle of the 1880s, a lot of swords had been manufactured in Germany, mostly in uh, Solingen, the famous knife and sword making centre of Solingen, but also potentially in other bits of Germany as well, and also manufactured in other um, famous blade making centres like Liège, for example. So the fact is that lots of swords were imported in 
um, and both officers' swords and um, war department purchased swords, so things like cavalry swords and cutlasses as well. Many of many of these were made abroad up until the middle of the 1880s. So after that point, anything which is stamped or etched that's made in England or um, London made, it's also showing you that apart from specifically being London, um, it might also just be showing that it's English. This is a British product and it's not something that's been imported in. But why was this important to them? Well, British trading officials who introduced the term made in Germany, for example, were clearly to some degree being protectionist with their um, economics. So they were trying to protect the economy of Britain against a um, mass influx of, influx of mass produced goods from Germany. And in many cases, the German factories were bigger, they had more employees, and they could outproduce some of the uh, native um, homemade British products. So they were trying to protect British trade to some extent. But there's also a second element here, and this relates to the world of um, swords specifically, but is surprisingly important. And it's also important to note that this specific incident and period of history, although it's not widely known outside of the sword collecting um, communities, actually had a knock-on effect on all sorts of other trade and manufactured goods and imports. And that was the series of so-called sword scandals that happened in the 1880s. These sword scandals particularly focused on German-made products and painted them very much as inferior, cheap, mass-produced goods, perhaps akin to what we might uh, see sometimes things being uh, made in China, objects being labelled as today, um, and very much wanted to paint these as uh, guilty of failing the, the sort of stringent tests that British made products had. In 1882, the British Army and Navy went to war in Egypt to protect British control over the Suez Canal, which was so vital to trade and control links, especially with the jewel in the crown of empire, India. Egypt became a British protectorate, and in 1884 to 86, the British armed forces again found themselves in the region, in the Sudan, fighting the Mahdi's expansionist campaigns, which again threatened stability of trade in Egypt, and had taken the life of General Gordon of Khartoum. During these campaigns, British swords, bayonets, and cutlasses encountered actual hand-to-hand -hand combat, and many suffered failures in the process. There were various first-hand and anecdotal accounts of blades bending or breaking in combat, from cavalry swords to infantry bayonets and even navy cutlasses. Whether this was true or not, or whether it was simply an economic uh, plan to try and give an advantage to British manufacturers or not, it's difficult for us to ascertain today. But regardless, these so-called sword scandals were in the national newspapers. They were in regularly, and uh, not just you know cavalry swords, not just infantry bayonets, not just navy uh, cutlasses and cutlass bayonets, but they were all tested and they were all exposed to this sort of media attention. And very much the, the blame was completely put um, on the German manufacturers. And again, reinforcing this idea that German products were mass produced, they were cheaper, uh, but they, they were also therefore inferior and uh, not worth um, saving the money to get these inferior goods. And we have to remember, this is the Victorian era, the, the era of empire and um, conquest conquest and th there was a huge amount of patriotism rolled into this and you know the death of um, soldiers and sailors was taken very very seriously and even if there was a suggestion statistically of course it was um, it could only have been a tiny tiny percentage of deaths during the uh, aforementioned wars but even if any British uh, armed forces personnel had lost their lives because of an inferior sword blade or bayonet, then you know this was scandalous and that's why it was such big news in the newspapers of the time. So the immediate upshot was that a series of tests were devised um, at the various arms factories and testing centres uh, for um, swords, bayonets and cutlasses. Um, and they tested whole great batches of these swords. And it has to be said they didn't only test the German made ones, they tested the uh, British made ones as well. You might be thinking, well, how do they know which is which? Well, blades had manufacturing marks on them. Uh, so quite simply, if they have a Kirschbaum uh, helmeted figure on, you know that it's made in Solingham by Kirschbaum or WKC, as they became in um, 1883. Um, or indeed, if it's got the mark of Robert Molenson, you know it's made in Birmingham. Uh, if it's got a Wilkinson mark, you know it's made in London, and so on. Um, and they did test huge batches of these weapons, uh, quite um, 
brutally actually, they did very brutal testing, almost to failure point, to find out which batches of weapons were, in, both in terms of you know, which types of weapons, but also which particular manufacturers of weapons were failing the most often. Now two basic conclusions came out of this process. Number one, the headline which we've already talked about, was that German manufacturers um, were regarded to have supplied inferior products in many, many cases to the British government. Now there's, a, there's an elephant in the room here in that all weapons which came into British military use, army or navy, were tested and proved before they were approved for use and given to a regiment or to a ship or whatever. Now, therefore, if they've been tested and proved, well, surely isn't the testing and proofing, uh, hasn't, haven't they failed? Uh, but they don't seem to have addressed that so much in this because that would have laid the blame at their own door, which obviously we know governments are never too keen to lay the blame at their own door. Instead, they went, nope, it's the German manufacturers that are at fault. Now, in fairness, the statistics whether they are 100% true or not, we don't know, but the statistics do show that the German-made blades seem to have failed uh, more often than the British-made blades uh, in some cases. And this was to do perhaps with the um, heat treatment uh, processes or perhaps there's some debate that maybe the storage processes and that some of those um, blades had been allowed to rust and were then cleaned and the method of cleaning had ruined the heat treatment. So there's various, it gets complicated, but basically they concluded that the German made blades were the problem. Um, now there's a second element to this as well. The second element was they also concluded that the design of certain weapons, which admittedly was down to the War Department themselves, the design of some of those weapons left something to be desired and they focused on quite minute details such as, as the depth of the fullers and the shape of the back of the blade, the shapes of the points, uh, the lengths of the blades relative to their thickness at the base and really very precise things and the conclusion there was that in a number of cases both in um, in terms of cavalry swords, uh, infantry bayonets, and also cutlasses and cutlass bayonets, that in some cases the blades were not of the optimal design and this added to the likelihood that they might bend or break in use. So there were two upshots of these tests. Number one, German-made blade bladed weapons basically ceased. Okay, They stopped being procured by the British government pretty much from uh, 1886, 1887 onwards. You just don't get any more German bladed weapons being uh, imported for government, um, government issued weapons. That's the first thing. The second thing is there were a series of uh, modifications, uh, scrappage in some cases, and replacements with new models of swords, bayonets, and um, cutlasses. So what we see is several new models of um, sword and bayonet and cutlass come out at the end of the 1880s and around 1890 and into the early 1890s. And that's the reason is these sword scandals. They considered, right, not only do we have a problem with the German manufacturing, but we have a problem with the designs. So they replaced the German manufacturing and they replaced quite a lot of the designs, or in some cases, modified the designs, the earlier designs, to, to solve the problem as they saw it. Now, partially coincidentally, or perhaps not, perhaps the two things are quite closely intertwined, and I would suggest they are. In 1887, British officials, putting aside swords for a minute here, British officials decided that there had been a big influx of mass-produced German products into Britain, and many of these weren't really um, up to standard. They weren't considered very good. Um, and so the British government decided that they wanted buyers to be aware of when something seemed cheap, that it was made in Germany, and for the buyer to be aware of that fact. So they, in 1887, um, started. they introduced the Made in Germany stamp. Now, this is where we come back to the uh, Made in England stamp. Now, so a lot of people ask when Made in England was introduced, and as we've seen, it's basically in the 20th century. But what's interesting is this is predated by quite a long way, 1887, by Made in Germany. And in a way, you could argue that this is the thing, certainly in the modern world, that really kicked off this whole process because it was the British government imposing, really saying to the Germans, right, if you're importing to us, you have to put made in Germany on the product or it can't be sold in the country. Um, and there was a stigma attached to this in Britain for the aforementioned reasons, the idea that this meant therefore the product was of lesser quality and that was why it was cheaper. 
There is a subtext to this that obviously economics and uh, rivalry are involved and the fact is that um, German, the Germans had large factories and a large workforce and could produce things at lower costs and it didn't mean that they were lesser quality it meant that due to mass manufacturing processes and newer factories they could produce things at a lower cost and they could outcompete British trade. Now clearly it's in the British government's interests to protect the British economy. So undoubtedly there are several things at play here. Yes, probably some of the German products were lower quality, but also yes, it's the British government protecting their trade. And funnily enough, we see this in America, of course, remember the USA wasn't the industrial giant that it would later become at this time in the 1890s. And we see a similar thing in 1890, of course, happening later on with the Made in England. So it's kind of like what goes around comes around. The British government said to Germany, you've got to put Made in Germany on things. And the American government in 1890, in 1890, so three years later, said to everyone, you've got to put made in whatever country on it. So there's degrees of protectionism for, for native or home trade, uh, but there's also, there are admittedly other, other elements and concerns about um, quality and things like this wrapped up in there as well. Now, of course, to modern thinking, this is quite ironic because in the modern world, made in Germany usually denotes great quality. Um, certainly with things like cars and other types of engineering, we associate German manufacturing manufacturing uh, with high quality but that wasn't the case in Britain in the 1880s and 1890s and in fact really probably up until uh, World War One. We've got to remember that just as in the modern world reputation associated with a brand or even a country can fluctuate so what is regarded as not great quality 10 years ago if that company or that brand does really, really well and produces new products and builds a reputation for itself, it can be that only a decade later, it can gain a great reputation. We see this, of course, with car brands today. And Jack Ewing, in A Brief History of Made in Germany, explains that Britain's attempt to shield domestic companies from competition backfired. Made in Germany became a synonym for quality, in fact. The story of how Germany succeeded within a few decades still tells us something about the German mindset and tradition. So as mentioned by World War I, uh, made in Germany or German made products actually had a great reputation um, such that uh, things like binoculars and pistols uh, were highly sought after by British and American um, officers. These things were seen as great quality and they were. Um, and the reputation only increased further into the 20th century and of course we all know the fantastic fantastic reputation that German engineering had attained by World War II uh, and the things that they manufactured already in the 1930s. So the fact is that uh, this story and the story of how Made in Germany was seen as an inferior product and how trying to put Made in England on things was trying to imply a superior product it did kind of backfire in many, many ways. And uh, Made in Germany is one of those great success stories that doesn't only touch on things like the swords um, behind me and also firearms and other military hardware like binoculars and watches and things like this, but it, it bleeds over into everything else. Um, and I think it's also one of those areas where for a long time people um, studying particular areas of antiques or particular areas of history have not necessarily realized that their area is affected by another area. So for example, if you search when did Made in England appear uh, on Google, you'll come up with lots of results about pottery and some about silver. But the fact is that this also connects to the world of swords as well and you know firearms and other things. And these were all interconnected. Um, and in some regards, you know, and the sword scandals of the 1880s should be more widely known because whilst sword collectors know about these sword scandals, the fact is that these sword scandals of the 1880s started a ball rolling which actually created and gave impetus to the made in Germany idea which gave uh, the Americans, you could argue, the idea for made in England and all the other made-ins that they um, imposed and, and so it's all part of a connected thing um, and the sword scandals should be more widely known especially as they're so early in this story and it is 1887 was really a critical date in this not the 20th century dates that you sometimes see when you look up when was made in England uh, introduced or such like. 
I hope this has been interesting. Uh, please, if you haven't subscribed already, do. Lots more videos like this on the channel and lots of other things related to swords and history and um, all sorts of stuff. Um, give us a like and I will see you really soon again on the channel for another video. Cheers, folks.